So as we are still in the liturgical season of Easter, the season of resurrection, of new life, and new beginnings, it seems appropriate to look at Genesis, which also tells very important stories of beginnings. Throughout Lent, we entered into Jesus' story. And now we get to go back and look at the start, the beginning of the chronicle of God's people. Last week, Dave began our Genesis journey with a look at the creation narrative. God breathed and spoke his creation into being. He looked around at his magnificent handiwork and declared it good, so very good. The trees of the field, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the humans created from the earth, the soil itself. All of it was good, and God was delighted, and he blessed his creation. As we know, it does not take long for things to go sideways in God's marvelous world. Today we're going to look at a few of those instances when human beings do not act in the image of God that they carry. Instead of following God's plan and good design, humans act out of their own self-interest and follow their own desires. These stories tell us about creation at risk, how humans distort God's creation. These stories tell us about sin, but they also tell us a lot about God. Last week, Dave talked about theology, the theology at work in the creation stories. And theology is a big word that essentially just means words that we use to talk about God. These ancient stories in Genesis show us how God's people tried to understand what and who God is. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, and the Tower of Babel show us the mess that humans can make. But more importantly, they show us who God is. Words about God. Words trying to understand and make sense of God and God's people. So I'm going to try something a little different today that I don't normally do. We have a PowerPoint. And we're going to go through the story of Cain and Abel. And hopefully it is interesting for you. <laughs> I've chosen to focus on Cain and Abel, but all of these early accounts of sin tell similar stories about humans and God. So let's look at how the story begins. And the human knew Eve, his woman, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have got me a man with the Lord. And so what's interesting in this verse here is Eve is making a pun on the Hebrew word kana. So kana means to get or acquire or to make. So Cain's name, Cain, is a pun on that verb, to get. So much like Adam was given the task of naming the animals and plants, here Eve sees herself as a partner with God in creating or man-making, which speaks to the idea that humans created by God can work with God in co-creating. I also think here Eve shows that she realizes that God continues to make. Creation is not finished, but God keeps fashioning, keeps making, keeps creating. God and humans may rest on the Sabbath, but work is not done. Abel is the second born, and thus we are introduced to the idea of God favoring the less important, the ignored, and the marginalized. This is a theme that we see throughout the Old and New Testaments. Both brothers offer sacrifices to God, but God favors Abel's offering, perhaps because Abel makes the greater sacrifice by offering the best of his flock. And this is where Cain starts to stray from God's desires and starts to follow his own wishes. God desires an offering that is actually a sacrifice, not just a nice gift. And God tells Cain this. We can go to the second slide. 
The Lord says, If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Just as God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge, here God says that Cain has a choice. And we learn something about God and humans here. God gives us choices. God allows us to choose to follow him and his ways. What does Cain do, though? Does he rule over his sin? Or does he open the door for it? Well, Cain kills Abel. He really throws open that door for sin. Let's go to the next slide. This is where it gets a little weird for me. The Lord says to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord says, what have you done? So what does God know here? He must know what's going on, right? Is God testing Cain? How do God and Cain respond to this tragedy? Both God and Cain have curious reactions to this episode. God curses Cain. The consequence of Cain's devastating sin is a curse. God tells Cain that the land will no longer be fertile for him. He will no longer have a home farm, but is cursed to wander as a nomad. And if you remember Dave's sermon last week, or if you've been part of the Dazed and Confused group, you know that Dave talks about this a lot, that um, when Genesis was written or compiled, is a product and a response to the exile. So a lot of what happens in the Old Testament is the Israelites processing this idea that they're loved by God but also sent into exile. The idea that the big curse Cain must struggle against is wandering or exile, which makes sense in that context. The Israelites are looking back at their beginnings and they're trying to find words to understand how and why God is the way he is. And also trying to understand their place as God's chosen people. And here is what I think is the biggest takeaway from these early stories of human sin and people straying from God's ways. Yes, God curses Cain and sends him away. Yes, Cain is devastated by this, of course. He's shattered by his own actions and by God's curse. Cain says that to be hidden from God's presence is like a death sentence. Because he is hidden from God and no longer protected by God, Cain thinks he will be killed. Let's go to the next slide. Cain says, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And there we go. Being sent away from God is the absolute worst. This is the punishment. This is the curse. This is also the consequence for Adam and Eve and the builders of the Tower of Babel. But here is also where we see the greatest character of God. His goodness and mercy. Cain cries out to God because he's afraid. God, people will kill me. How does God respond? Let's go to the next slide. The Lord said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. God's mercy and goodness toward Cain is not what Cain expects, not what he deserves either. Cain has sinned in a pretty big way. He killed his brother. That was not what God desired. And yet, and yet after all this, God puts a mark on Cain to protect him. Mercy, goodness, compassion, compassion. 
But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You can go to the last line there. Think of Adam and Eve. God tells them that the consequence of eating the tree of knowledge is death. They ignore God's will and eat from the tree. But do they die? No, they don't. They're cursed and sent away, a lot like Cain. But God is so merciful. He makes them clothes. He dresses them. Think of Noah and the flood. The Lord saw that humanity was so totally evil that their evil and violence had infected all of God's creation. And yet, God cannot bring himself to totally destroy. He saves Noah and the animals. Humans start building a tower, thinking they could reach God or be like God. But this is not God's desire for humans. Does God kill and destroy? No. The Lord disperses the people all over the earth, scatters them and scrambles their languages. All of these stories from the early chapters of Genesis tell us some fundamental things about God and humans. They also show us how the Israelite writers of Genesis wrestle with a God who they understand as slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and also a God who saw the Israelites conquered and sent into exile. We also still wrestle with these two truths. God is good, and bad things happen. We, like Adam and Eve and Cain, experience sin and the consequences of that sin. But we also experience and trust in God's goodness and mercy. To me, the story of Cain and Abel illustrates that we cannot fathom the depths of God's mercy. There are consequences of sin. God, Cain does not get off the hook. God sends him away. God turns his face away from Cain and sends him to the land of Nod. But, and it's a big but, God promises that Cain will not be killed. This promise comes in the form of a sign or a mark that tells everyone that Cain is protected by God. Cain is still special to God, loved by God. God is merciful. And his mercy is far greater, deeper, wider than our human minds can comprehend or describe. As CMF and the broader church continues to journey into an unknown and uncertain future, we look back at the beginning of God's people and the beginning of our story as God's people in Genesis. And what do we find? We find a God who does not abandon his people. We find a God who is faithful, loving, and merciful. We find a God who does not desert a sinful Cain, but rather marks him as a child of God despite his terrible actions. There are, of course, consequences for sin, but they're never the kind of consequences that we would dish out if somebody wronged us. If someone wounded or killed someone I loved, would I go to great lengths to see that person protected from harm? Probably not. But thankfully, God's ways are not our ways. His goodness and mercy are so much broader than the measures of our human minds. The church may be more scattered than it once was, but God is steadfast and his mercy endures forever.